So hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us uh, today in Hong Kong. We're at noon, uh, but for Remy it's already in the evening. And I'm very grateful to uh, invite Remy to join us today for our um, paid studio visits uh, in collaboration with uh, Consul Consulate uh, of Canada of Hong Kong and Macau. And today we have our first um, talk with Remy Siu, who is a Vancouver-based Hong Kong artist. Um, just a little bit of introduction of what Remy does. He is he started more as a musician, and then he moved on very quickly to you know uh, trying to use various type of mediums, especially elements from performance arts, to really create these uh, almost theater-like pieces. And by integrating different softwares, hardwares, he really wants to push the boundary of what, how, you know, an art piece that combines with music, performance, lighting and sound uh, can really, can really be. And then uh, recently, he actually also explores the medium of game mechanics from video games even like all the game rendering and it will be very interesting to see how he has evolved throughout this period of time so without further ado um remy uh, please, please feel free to introduce yourself and uh yeah let's go thank you yeah um thanks for the, that introduction i uh as you said i i'm a new media artist and composer i'm i'm based in uh, vancouver bc uh which is located on the unceded uh, traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, you know, the, I guess when I do these things in Hong Kong, sometimes people do ask me why I, I make this land acknowledgement, but it's a larger kind of um, effort, at least in the arts community in Canada, to kind of acknowledge the, the land that we are on. In this case, in Vancouver, it, it was unceded, um, and also currently happening outside of, say, like, uh, of course, this talk, um, there is quite a significant event happening with a delegation of um, First Nations from Canada in um, visiting the Pope. And I believe the Pope actually issued uh, some kind of apology um, today. Um, but I have not caught up on that just yet. I just came back from from the studio and I'm here and uh, I will I will leave it at that for now. Um, so the um i can start by saying that i i studied uh, music composition at simon Fraser university here in vancouver and in the background slide i'm going to leave this slide up like this you're going to see ahead but it'll be easier for me to switch back and forth between windows as i'll do um so i studied music composition at simon Fraser university um part of uh studying there was a bit of a fluke um i was going to study film um at ubc um, but decided last minute to switch to music. And I don't really understand, remember why, um, but I got very lucky. I think I, I got lucky in that I entered a, a kind of multidisciplinary art school versus say um, uh, UBC, which is a little bit more conservatory-like. And that really influenced a lot of um, the work that I do today um, or that I've done. So uh, what do I mean by interdisciplinary art school? The Simon Fraser, uh, SFU, I'll say, um, has a kind of contemporary school for the contemporary arts where multiple disciplines kind of uh, exist in the same um, space. So there's music composition, there's uh, experimental theater, there's dance, there's visual art, and there's film, um, kind of all in the same school. Um, and because of that, I ended up doing a lot of collaborations with my peers in theater and in dance. Um, and that really kind of set me on a path in terms of um, the type of work I was making after I, I left school. So to kind of break down what it's like now a little bit, I have my personal projects. I, I have a, a company that uh, interdisciplinary arts company that I founded with another um, uh, Hong Kong diaspora and choreographer and um, a theater student um, named Hong Kong Exile. Um, and, and it's mostly been um, talking about the diasporic experience in Canada. Um, and we've been kind of making work for uh, 
eight something years now. And we've been touring that as well. And more recently kind of founded this uh, independent video game studio, Sunset Visitor Studios um, in the middle of, or at the beginning of the pandemic when everything was canceled. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, talking first about, you know, uh, kind of the work that I was making just immediately after um, school and, and how it kind of got me to the place that I, I am today uh, in terms of my practice. So, you know, there's three branches that I'll, I'll probably start with um, and, and we'll converge them or I converge them, I suppose, later on. Uh, so music composition, um, collaboration in the performing arts, and then music improvisation and playing in ensembles as um, a musician. Um, so the first one um, I would like to say, is, you know, at the time, a little while ago now, I guess, um, in the kind of new music discourse, uh, there was a movement of music that kind of was um, um, more, how should I say, uh, active in the 90s and the early 2000s called New Complexity. Um, and New Complexity was a movement of music that was asking for struggle, struggle and effort from the musicians. Um, but one thing that I was seeing uh, over time, because I was kind of like looking at this around 2013, 2012, and it had been around for like 20 or so years, that we were already seeing what I would call performance inflation within, with the musicians who were playing this music. I'm gonna show a quick sample of this just to give an idea of the type of complexity um, this score was asking the musician to do. And, and this is a Brian Fernie House score who was one of the um, um, kind of founded this movement uh, with his music. And so you can look at the score and in a lot of ways, um, yeah, it's very difficult, right? It's, it's extremely difficult score and it's very complex. Um, and, you know, this was kind of a macho thing to be playing at the time and writing at the time. Um, and so what was kind of interesting was that the, the composer that I was studying with, doing private studies with Rodney Sharman, um, had studied with Brian Fernie Howe. Um, and you know, he relayed to me a story of, of Brian listening to uh, a flute piece he had written uh, in a concert. And the, the flautist who, who played his piece played it extremely well, almost perfectly, effortlessly. Um, and my teacher had asked Brian, you know, what, what did you think of the performance? And I believe, uh, this is secondhand here, say that Brian said that it was too good. It was too perfect. Um, and because, and I think that's kind of what gets at the core of some of this movement um, at the time was that I believe this movement, um, I believe and other people do uh, kind of come to the conclusion that this kind of music was about problematizing the relationship between the musician and the score as a set of instructions. And that this, this score um, was not asking you to play it exactly perfectly, um, but it was a little bit of a in-between of, of, of exacting certain kinds of, of effort from the musician when it encountered uh, the musician and that that kind of feedback loop created a performance that was be just outside of what was written, um, that it contained elements that were not um, notated. That, uh, that was elements. definitely a nightmare for a pianist like me. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yes. it's, it's, it's quite <laughs> obvious that there's no way you can play all the notations and all the, you know, the, the crescendos and all the fortes and God knows what it's inside. So it, it seems like it's, it's intended to make... Um, the musician to be, you know, fail to play perfectly, isn't it? Yes, I think that that's kind of the, the performance that he was seeking, like one of effort and one um, that, yeah, included elements uh, probably from, because every performer is different from the performer, that was not, could not be, that was not notated exactly, right? Um, mm. So 
of course, the notes that he's notating here is, is very precise. But um, so that would that 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 is interesting because that's kind of what you know at the time there was lots of kind of back and forth in the discourse about like, well, why is he writing music so difficult? You know, like why is the um, you know why was he trying to do this? And a lot of people in the movement who was writing similar types of music kind of came to this. One of the defenses for this type of music was that yes, we're they were trying to problematize the score and make it um, uh, uh, not just a simple set of instructions, I suppose. Yeah, and actually, uh, uh, one of our audience, Jennifer, mentioned like the score as a mm -hmm. text is an, actually an artwork itself, which is very true mm -hmm. because um, I think we uh, sometimes when we work in art industry for too long, we do think you know a typical artwork is really just a painting or a sculpture, mm -hmm. but a lot of times we ignore the fact that text. Uh, is also a form of art, but not just as a poem. But I think here with this musical score as an example, it's it's using a text, you know, different kind of symbols, notations, um, you know, uh, all the music musical uh, technical terms. It really creates, you know, that kind of power that it it really allows mainly musicians to reflect their own um, approach to music whether it has to be all perfect, whether there is an element of improvisation. It's almost like, you know, when I, I think a lot of people, when we learn about jazz or improvisation, it's really from that kind of brick through from the convention that we realize we can uh, approach music with less of a perfectionist perspective, but actually we can play along with the mistakes and all the gaps in between the scores. And it, it is interesting because like some of the um, conceptual art that's text-based art that are tasks-based are sets of instructions mm. and, you know, notation to a certain extent is the, uh, also a set of instructions, but like with a little bit more resolution um, on the action and at, occurring generally at a higher frequency um, than, than say some of the other instructions that we saw there were more like language or uh, <laughs> language, I don't want to use the word, you know, written in may say English, right? So, um, mm. the, um, and so I, I'm going to go back to this point here where that, um, you know, in 2013, we were starting to see um, musicians kind of take the score and sight read it and, or, or, or eventually play it perfectly as if it was nothing. And that was interesting to me because I was like, when I heard that story about what, um, and I heard these arguments about like why uh, this music was kind of vital, um, it was kind of lost on me at the time because you know I had seen really gifted musicians just play it um, as if it was just any other piece, right? Like they weren't, they did the struggle was gone, and because I think I was, and this kind of thing that I was saying was performance inflation or performer inflation the skill of the performer uh, consistently inflating over time um, is partly due to that. And so, you know, we've seen this happen in, in music kind of um, Western music canon before uh, where um, ionization, um, the Verez piece that uh, used to be played by, I believe it's been a while since I've looked, it's like something like 12 or so percussionists and and now I, I remember seeing like a percussion trio play it. So a percussion trio could play um, what was once meant for 12 performers. Um, and they had just, I don't know, gotten over periods of time, just gotten better at uh, percussion music in general, like percussion logistics, all this stuff that percussionists have to deal with when they, when they play pieces. Um, so that, that I was noticing for sure. And so that this, um, uh, the score, the, the vital aspect of it, the problematic, problematic, problem, my, it was trying to problematize um, the score uh, object that was kind of being missed in a lot of these performances that I was seeing at the time because people just got too good, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll bank that for, for a bit. Um, because the next challenge at the time is more on a different branch of, of what I was doing, which was kind of music improvisation and playing in, in these makeshift ensembles. And we, we uh, spent a lot of time playing fluxes pieces, which were like these text-based scores giving us instructions 
on how to do it. And some of these uh, Fluxus pieces were game pieces. They were like, kind of like board game pieces. So I remember this one um, piece that kind of gave us a game board and some pieces. And we were supposed to roll dice, right, and play it. And then if we landed on this square, we would play this note or whatever, right? And there were rules to the game as well. Um, but, you know, this being kind of um, improvisation as well, asking us to kind of think about how we would, um, say, make sound uh, from scratch uh, or on the spot in real time. We, we realized we were hitting some ceiling of hum, human cognition. <laughs> um, and maybe this is just me. I'm not, a, I don't profess to be a very good musician, right? Um, but I will say that I was experiencing um, cognitive overload where I had to, you know, uh, I was playing, I think, a cello or something. I had to think about um, the sound that I was making and whether that sound was interesting moment to moment at a, at a micro level. Um, and I also had to think about the sounds everybody else was making um, and listen to that and respond to how they were making the overall sound of the ensemble. And I was also trying to play this game properly that the Fluxus score asked me to play and also minding um, certain rules. And at the beginning of the piece, it always started fine. But as okay. the rules got more complicated, um, that was when things kind of fell apart for everybody, <laughs> including me, where mm -hmm. there was one order of complexity to the rule that we were asked to do that, that started to, um, uh, that was when my, I think our brains just like, we can't do it. Like either we're gonna play this game properly or, and we're gonna make no sound um, or, right. we're, or we're just gonna like drone or we're gonna try and make um, interesting sound moment to moment. And these kind of competing interests for us um, uh, was kind of, um, they were fighting and, you know, the performances were never something we were satisfied with. And what was additionally difficult was that we were also trying to um, kind of uh, keep with the flux of spirit. So as you know, we could have performed it, you know, we could have just pretended to move the pieces exactly where we wanted them to move to a certain extent, write another layer of notation about like where we're gonna place these pieces um, mm -hmm. and just play a piece, a fixed piece. But, you know, of course we did not try, we didn't want to do that because that was not in the spirit of these fluxus pieces. Um, but that was something to flag for ourselves was that we could not do it all in our brain. Um, do you think your difficulty at that point was uh, because of the clash of spontaneity and improvisation versus you know those all the rules that were written in the piece like you have to do a, a certain you know things during the the performance do you think it's that kind of uh clash of different perspective at the same time that makes it very challenging or if there is something else i think it that is that period it is that clash right and mm. so you know and you know the simple rules were easy to follow like say i don't know i can't remember that piece that well but like say we moved a, a piece fell on a blue square everybody makes a x sound or something i don't know whatever sound and another rule is another piece falls on a red square and then we make this type of sound and then yellow red and that that was fine all of this was fine say like these kind of first order um rules that we were asked to follow but the moment there were any sort of conditionals where it's like mm -hmm. okay um blue square you can play this sound but if there's a, somebody else on a red square and a yellow square, then you cannot play these things and you must do this. Um, mm. That was when, you know, it was like, <laughs> that's when it got difficult. And there was like six people playing, right? So we we're like, oh, we cannot remember the exact state of everybody's pieces and what squares they were on and stuff like this. So that was where we kind of got caught up. Um, so do you think... So I'm very interested in that because um, I think that's very different from uh, when you have a jazz performance on stage. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. jazz, first of all, of course, you don't have all those rules, game rules and conditions listed mm -hmm. on the scores. But there's mm -hmm. always a moment when uh, perhaps one of the, uh, I don't know, one of the uh, pianists maybe played the wrong note and then 
the 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 whole jazz band needs to improvise and kind of you know play mm-hmm. with the mistake, and mm-hmm. that is used to be quite spontaneous, but it's also it really you know puts the whole band into you know a test to see if they mm-hmm. are co- coordinated enough. But mm-hmm. it seems it's still very different from this kind of game pieces you are performing because these are. I think in these game performances, you you really need to not not only just observing or really pay attention to the other performers at the same time, but it's it's suddenly there there is indeed a longer time for communication. It's not just on the spot. So I think that might be the processing, the time of processing, maybe what you said, like the ceiling of human cognition in the performance. Do you think it's mm-hmm. it's that kind of um, challenge that you? You faced, or is that something that you uh, uh, realized during that perform those performances? I think we tried to. Uh, I think we ignored our inability to do it, and then, and then when we did it, we 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 hit the wall, right, and realized that we could not actually do it because there's the additional aspect of then there's like 50 70 people watching you do it and you're just like oh damn like <laughs> we, we can't actually do this <laughs> um and so yes i think it's this year we hit this human cognition barrier mm-hmm. um it when you know it was improvisation group so then if, when we were just improvising and listening to each other and worrying about the micro sound this way and the macro form in that regard um you know, we were quite experienced at that point as an ensemble to do that. But then we were seeking kind of more um, ways to to give structure and meaning to the the actual um, work, I guess. And and of course, you know, there's something to be said about an ensemble and, and a kind of ensemble's memory with one another and that growing as some sort of object. But um, this uh, uh, this we were just trying to yeah give find a way to like deal with form right like to deal with form and and a lot of the free improvisation we had did not stem from say uh pieces like in some jazz there are pieces that you are are kind of playing from and then there's like openings and things like this and and various things so um yeah so that we we kind of ended up um kind of not kind of giving up on these game pieces we couldn't do them <laughs> mm. <laughs> anymore we were just um on these kind of i should say analog game pieces because we're gonna i'm gonna move to this next part here um i realize i don't have a slide for this third part with the collaboration um so i'm just gonna do this um and, <laughs> and um say that uh in the meantime, while I was doing this, I was doing collaboration with kind of uh, theater and dance, right? And mm. so theater and dance um, with Hong Kong Exile and with other people, um, the kind of role that I was playing at the time was, uh, especially in theater, in devised theater that we where there's no script and there's an ensemble of people trying to make a piece from scratch together. Uh, I was having to also make sound from with my computer to catch up with uh, the performers. So if the performers on stage, I was actively not on stage with them, but like on the side having to watch and um, listen to what they were doing and respond musically and with sound. A little bit like a Foley artist, but of course, outside of sound effects, we were, I was thinking about music and also thinking about scoring and all these different things. And, um, and also offering them in real time, kind of like things for them to work with on, on stage. And so that became a big part of this. And I was really uh, jealous because um, in these processes, uh, it felt like there was a really interesting feedback loop, a very fast feedback loop um, between trying something and then trying it again and then, or discovering something like that something would appear in the room, um, so to speak, that we would be like, wow, that's really a cool idea. But we obviously we did not think about it when we did it, but we should remember it and, and, and try to take it forward. Uh, and in my notational practice, music notation practice, that was just not happening, right? You're just in a room, you're sitting by yourself and you are writing these notes 
onto pieces of paper and there was a kind of lack of um, forces acting on me. Really, it was just kind of like I was going to put this note down and no one's going to stop me from putting this note down. It would be different if I had somebody kind of sitting across from me at the table, kind of like either it's, you know, smacking me across the head or like, you know, spilling ink on my, on my, uh, then I would have some sort of feedback loop. Right. But it was not that I was like, I was just free to do whatever I wanted. And that was not a, a place that I found kind of creatively um, excited about. Um, and so with the collaboration in theater dance, it really taught me that um, I wanted to find a way that there was a feedback loop, right? Uh, in, in the work, in the creation process that was very fast. Um, mm. And the other situation was that um, being able to kind of create sound with the work as it was being made, made it very integrated um, with, the, with the theater um, or whatever was happening on stage. Um, as opposed to say, like, I came in afterwards. And I've worked on more traditional plays like this, where like they had a script, there was, um, I don't know, people acting. <laughs> and then um, I would come in and like watch the, the play and be like, okay, well, I'll, I'll write this type of music for this scene, that type of music for that scene. Um, and it would just kind of layer on top. It would be a very additive process. Whereas in these collaborations, I found that it was a very subtractive process for everybody involved because there was not enough space for everybody to all be stacking everything on top of everything forever. And so um, that became a huge part of my practice about uh, having to ask art hard questions about one's own uh, medium and being like, well, I'm gonna, in this uh, performance work, I'm gonna have to just give up my concern about pitch or my concern about this or my concern about that and dancers and theater people would have to do that as well so that we could kind of fit together and make a piece that you know actually uh, worked um, all these elements and these concerns work together and so I started to think about interdisciplinary performance art or sorry performing arts um, not so much as yeah the stacking of mediums or all mediums being present in this way but really um, a quite hard negotiation and attrition between all these mediums uh, mm. based on what um, the, the work actually was um, or what we wanted to accomplish. And then we were considering it with all of these various modalities uh, and experience from these different uh, places. So that kind of led me uh, into programming um, lights as well for performance um, because I was being able to react with sound but one of the frustrating things about um, the theater process was that you know you generally could not work with lights right you had to um, be in the theater before you uh, open the show I suppose before the these lights come into play and the lights changed the whole thing <laughs> and so mm. and so because of my allergy to like just taking something and then stacking it on top of it at the end, um, I really wanted to uh, have the same control over lights that I had over the sound. And so then when we were in the rehearsal space, we were considering pretty much what you see is what you get environment, right? I'm gonna borrow that phrase. Um, so, so that you know what you're getting um, and that there will be no artistic surprises later down the line. Um, about it. And, and you can consider every gesture or action as it appears, as opposed to kind of trying to um, project what may be like way later. Um, so when you work with um, lights, um, mm -hmm. I'm, it's quite intriguing because I'm sure in terms of um, the sonic elements, I'm sure you, you, you're very experienced in how to maneuver and how to play with it. But with lights, uh, if I understand correctly, in theaters, it's difficult to improvise light lighting. You know, it's it's yeah. pretty much pre-programmed and tested, rehearsed. So there might be a chance if perhaps if you're doing collaborative uh, piece in a theater, in case you, you also include a lot of spontaneous elements into it, the lighting may not really fit with 
the performance out of sudden. So we encounter this kind of situation. Uh, what what is your approach dealing with this discrepancy? Yeah, so that that's an interesting question because uh, I realized that pretty much right away when I tried to turn on a, a um, an old school light, I would say, like a traditional mm-hmm. lighting um, a park hand or something uh, from uh, at a theater, and I realized that those lights are have like a, a smooth curve. Uh, when you turn on a light, like a an old school light, right? It will kind of turn on and then turn off, right? Um, and I was like, oh, sh- oh man, like to have a light that has a built-in essentially attack, like set attack decay and, you know, f- especially when I get to deal with all those elements in sound because I was using um, uh, electroacoustic means or electronic means to make sound. Um, that was not a good mix. Um, and it's true because the other logistical difficulty in most theaters is that they have traditional or they have more um, house hangs, so to say, like they, they have a set hang and then everything you add onto that is kind of special, right? And so sometimes you can add special, sometimes you cannot. Mm. And so if you walk into a theater and they say there's like no specials, um, you just got to deal with whatever uh they give you yeah. what however it is or like whatever mm-hmm. state it was left in before right um hopefully they had reset it right um so i was at that point i guess i had just was like okay forget about these analog lights they're they're too slow um on a on and off when you turn them on and off or when they like there's there's a kind of nice warm curve to them which has its own effect but this is not what i was seeking at the time um and also, um, what's it called? The uh, the logistics of dealing with the the lights already in the theater was difficult, right? It just meant having to negotiate with theaters about all these specials and things like this. And I didn't really, <laughs> didn't really, really want to do that. And mm. so uh, I, that's kind of how I switched over to just using projection light as a source mm. of 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 uh, completely lighting a work. So we use projection light um, almost exclusively at Hong Kong Exile to light all the work. Um, And that is, for lack of a better word, is digital light. Um, And when you turn uh, it on and off, it turns on and off instantly. I mean, mean, if you turn the projector on, it runs the fan and cools down, right? But if you show a, like, say, white box, uh, it will light that area. And then when you turn that box off, it'll be gone in the Mm. same frame right or the next frame um so we're dealing with you know something that can now um turn uh, on and off in like 1 60th of a second right it's about your you know most of these uh projectors are running at 60 hertz um, Mm. and so it will be the next frame that these things turn off and so um that was really interesting because all of a sudden now that that matched to a certain extent, kind of, at least to the human perception, um, the sound that I could make. Um, right. And so I, if I were linking these in the computer, controlling them all at the same time, we had a very strong causality um, between the light and the sound that was happening um, mm-hmm. and a kind of effectual um, uh, byproduct, I suppose, <laughs> of, of what was happening. Um, so that's kind of, yeah it became then more about no longer just improvising with sound, but improvising the entire sonography with the performers. So being able to give them light or follow light um, or follow them with light. Uh, And because, you know, it's not physically hung somewhere, uh, you know, and we would just set up projector, uh, we would just have projector setups that covered the entire play space of the stage. So instead of having to, um, you know, switch the light to switch a spotlight, I would just change instantaneously where the spotlight was anywhere on the, on the surface of the stage. Um, so that was, that was kind of how we uh, dealt with this aspect. And that kind of got me into programming and also realizing that um, I was nearing this cognitive uh, barrier again uh, because I had to deal with many aspects from my computer and I, I only could do so only so much at a time. And I was realizing, you know, like my, my feeble body was like failing in this regard 
to keep up with all the aspects on, on stage. So then I, you know, the next step was I just replaced myself with a computer and mm. then and, uh, tried to um, make pieces where I am programming all of these from, uh, from a central kind of program that runs all of them. And that program became, became the piece. Um, the other thing that I kind of like moved on to was thinking about how, whoops, um, these things would be mutable scores um, delivered on, sorry, on mutable delivery systems. And so I guess, you know, a mutable score is a score that can change at any time, like uh, to a certain extent, uh, for our purposes, we can say that paper cannot change. Um, or what is on the content of that paper or the intention of what was on that paper cannot change after as the, the score is, is kind of delivered to the musician. Um, and paper is, uh, the score cannot change, um, but the mutable, with the mutable delivery system, the, the actual materiality of the paper, like you won't allow it to ever do that update, right? Mm -hmm. um, so these were now kind of making these software scores um, delivered on, you know, something as simple as just like a computer screen, which is a mutable delivery system um, that can change the instructions um, on, um, what's it called, in real time uh, wow. for the performer. So uh, do you have any examples of that? I think that's quite intriguing, like how you can, like, mm -hmm. what's the, what's the mechanism? Like, do you scan the, like, printed score or how do you change well, yeah. the, in real time? So actually, the, um, this like, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I will get there in one second. That's the next kind of um, kind of here. The, uh, the next thing I kind of focused on was real time game mechanics, which was like if we were thinking about what I was talking about earlier, I guess I deleted it. The, the um, kind of fluxus scores being uh, not or like analog game mechanics, so to speak, they were like governed by um, not computers. Uh, these real-time game mechanics were digital real-time game mechanics that could respond just as quickly. So it's very interesting you ask that question about the light because almost all of the stuff is just about getting things to be responding, <clears throat> responding at a speed that is um, at, uh, good, <laughs> yeah. fast enough, right? Fast enough to deal with with hmm. uh, everything with all around. All the changes, yeah. With all the changes. Um, so, I will come back to that. So this this work, uh, pulse common frequency number three, or this whole series one, two, and three that I made over a couple of years, um, did was kind of working with these uh, mutable delivery systems with these screens uh, and you could see to a certain extent these scores were kind of generated and then we would be able to send these scores in real time over to the performer and swap them out in the order of them and things like this. So these scores, of, they had lots of rules behind them like which ones would show up and how they would show up and, and conditions that I was talking about earlier that was like way too complex for my human brain to deal with in real time. Mm or like at the speed that I would find interesting on stage. This happened, obviously, this happened in like you know, one very, 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 very small amount of time, right? The computer just makes the decision or it all just happens instantaneously for us. Um, and so, you know, we have all the, the show kind of now lived um, as a, a, a piece of software as well, kind of going through all of these different steps and, um, with all of these different types of permutations of how we would use this, uh, these scores. So um, I will play a quick video. Um, I have it loaded here.
I'm going to pause this uh, for now. Well, I'll turn down the uh, sound a bit. So I talk over it. Um, what, what Jennifer asks, uh, yes. Um, the tasks of, of labor, that uh, kind of repetitive labor, but also what the piano pedagogy is <laughs> sometimes and, and the kind of like um, uh, punitive aspects of piano pedagogy or music pedagogy in general. That are these punishing repetitive acts that put people in competition with each other in artificial ways. Um, so um, the um, there are these different types of games that we built just from these inputs of like um, uh, the the piano, right? The piano is just this really one big keyboard, right? Uh, Yes, I have a website. It's uh, www.remisu.com. Um, and sorry, I'm just answering the chat for people who are wondering what I'm saying um, here. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so this uh, kind of work is, um, you know, when they do get asked to do these exercises, these exercises are interesting. Like I, from, they're mostly called from, um, um, Royal Conservatory of Music, uh, that's a thing in Canada. It's kind of, you have to do it to take your piano tests and stuff like this. And they have these like technique exercises, right? And so a lot of this stuff is called from that type of exercise. Um, and then also a lot of the stuff that uh, I had written specifically for this piece were um, not even thinking about what the sound would be, but what kind of motions the body was making. Um, when they were kind of reading the score and stuff like this. Uh, and they do get tested uh, to play these um, above a certain level of accuracy. And if they fail and then they make mistakes, they will have to um, do it again. So um, an example, do I have an example down? Uh, here you can see like you have this yellow line and if it falls below this red line, um, they've kind of, uh, they need to perform at a competency level, I guess is what we would call it, above this red line that was shifting. And so different sections were more difficult. And so we could make, a, um, we were now kind of composing sections of like, you know, performer elation when the, 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 um, these kind of competency red lines were quite low, right? They were quite free, they, they, you know, carefree. They didn't care, you know, like, you know, whatever they played or whatever they did on the piano. But then the moment these started to rise at a very high level, they were kind of like, you know, you, you get them really tense up. Um, there is one performance in Toronto that we did um, uh, that uh, they were stuck in one section interesting enough in a section where we asked them to play a, a phrase in unison. Um, and this time we, we think about musicians and dancers playing or, or performing something in unison, uh, but we were asking for a unison of something like 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds that they all press the key at the same time. Um, and they were stuck in this section in Toronto for about 30 minutes. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and and that was, I think, the best performance, one of the best performances we had of it, because like the audience was there with 30 minutes. And it was it was really tense. And also they took a break on stage um, for like a 10 minute break on stage where they like kind of um, just chilled out for a bit. And then mm -hmm. they eventually succeeded. And, and the audience was kind of like, you know, it was a a moment that you know the system allowed for but uh, we don't know if it would happen at any point in time and that's kind of also something we aim for is the creating the circumstances with the system um, to allow these things to happen emergent on the stage that are really interesting and and kind of get the performers to um, be human so to speak or to, to kind of like have 
certain aspects of, of them uh, both come out and or come to the surface. Um, and also the idea of like seeing a group of people trying to work together um, through something like musicians see this all the time when we try to rehearse, but it's not something maybe in that everybody gets to see all the time. And so we see people kind of like working together to achieve a goal, uh, but actually not pretending to work together. They're actually very much need to work together. Um, so that's a key word uh, with a lot of these performances that we, we just try never to pretend. Um, we never try to act frustrated. We never try to act this way or that way. We always it's want- almost like um, you're, you're putting the behind the scenes on the stage because I think this is almost presenting as some sort of musical, um, like a music rehearsal, but in a very intense uh, presentation. Because I think for a lot of performers and musicians, we always tend to have the training that we always have to play perfectly. And mm -hmm. when there's an intervention with the system and there's almost like a competition going on, like, you know, whether it's a su success or failure, it, it almost, again, put us back into all those, you know, hour long practices of perfection, you know, try to uh, make our own performance perfect. But then I, I'm very curious in terms of the mentality of the performance though, performers though, because mm -hmm. I think a lot, as I said, a lot of us are trained to be quite individualistic or, you know, just to hone our skills. But when they're in that kind of collaborative uh, manner, but also their goal is not to play, I don't know, like a, a song with a lovely melody, Actually, mm -hmm. do you do you see any changes of these performancer, uh, performers uh, while maybe you're preparing to work? I would love to hear a little bit more anecdotes yeah. if that's possible. So I can start off by saying that this we never rehearse this work. We never rehearse. Uh, we we only like the first time. Uh, well, I mean, we did some kind of testing, right? But uh, we I hid a lot of the structure of the work from the performers until they did it. Um, for like the first time I think in rehearsal, uh, just the first, the, sorry, not the rehearsal, but the, um, what's the, 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 um, the, the load in for into the theater, right? Just to test all the, everything is working. <clears throat> and um, so when they get on stage, when, especially when we went on tour, they haven't done it for um, sometimes months. And oh. um, they also don't know, um, what the system is going to ask for um, this time. And so you can imagine uh, these two performers here, Vicky Chow and Matt Poon, um, are concert pianists. And Vicky is very, Vicky and Matt are very, very good pianists. And like totally went up. Like Vicky plays in Bang on a Can in New York. Uh, Matt has won some very prestigious piano concert, piano surprises. Um, they, uh, Vicky was used to it. I had worked with Vicky before, but I think Matt was, was really um, uh, scared to fail on stage. Mm. <laughs> and I think, you know, like if you're a pianist, right? So like seeing pianists just fail on stage repeatedly kind of triggers you probably to a certain extent. Yeah, um, <laughs> definitely. And so, um, that's uh that is definitely something that uh happened with the performers where uh, they were not kind of expected to uh um like they were also like good at different things and matt was when and they kind of dealt with problems very differently when vicky got stuck on something she would kind of like pause and then take it with like a fast fast for ferocity right she would just like go at it and like you know and then matt would stop and and very slowly kind of like move kind of judging within the parameters of how long he had um whereas he was just attacking it very quickly um i haven't mentioned natalie on the on the furthest uh left here uh, she's actually not a professional pianist She's a dancer and, and one of the members of Hong Kong Excel, one of the founding members of Hong Kong Excel. She's a dancer and, and choreographer. 
And, um, you know, she hadn't played piano for like seven years when she started this. And so she was kind of the weak link uh, in these three and mm. purposely so. Um, but she, the way that she solved problems was very interesting. She was out of all of the, the pianists, the only one to ever kind of make a mis- start. This line started going down and then kind of stopped going down. Usually with these pianists, what because they're trained to make a mistake and ignore it and keep moving on, right? right. But the way that the system uh, registers their, their actions is that if you have to do it in a specific order, right? So if you played the note in the wrong order, you have to back up and think about what order you played it in and start playing it in the right order again. But you're not supposed to do that as a pianist, right? You're trained not to do that. And yeah. so with Matt and Vicky, you see these lines just kind of, you know, come right down mm. when they make a mistake and continue going down. Whereas with Natalie, it stops going down. Mm. Uh, she, she does stop. She, and she does kind of pause and think about the order. And so she has less pianist baggage to deal with in that way. Um, so, yeah, that's... that's uh, um, you know, this, this work dealing with these three. Uh, I should also say that uh, during the performance, these 3D printers are uh, in real time taking input of how their success and failures and kind of printing a, a cube uh, that's offset based on how well they've, they've done. Yeah. So like if they play a perfect um, show where up to a certain degree, they would produce a perfect cube. Um, but for every mistake they make, the cube is kind of like, so you can kind of see some of this here with these cubes, Oops. where you have this kind of like, uh, yeah, can I zoom in? Offsets, sorry, I can't really zoom in here. This is a show kind of curated by Andre and Jing. Hi, Andre and Jing. Um, and sometimes you can see that the more perfect ones are um, probably Vicky's. Uh, mm. So every so often she gets close to um, being able to do a, a perfect show, um, even though from scratch, so. Yes, I'm gonna check the time. I realized I talked a lot about no this work before moving to um, um mm-hmm. yeah uh, yeah just trying to say which work are you gonna want to talk about after this piece i think um i can quickly talk about this work um I'll, I'll move very quickly on this one where you know like as you had asked i was working with kind of western notation still in this kind of the um, this work and kind of Get, delivering this with the mutable delivery system, but I wanted to get away from, from traditional notation. And so I made this work, which is entirely inside a kind of a 3D virtual space um, yeah. where the performer this time, not having to be a specialist, um, like last time it was kind of made for pianists, um, able to uh, kind of pick up and play. So anybody can kind of come and pick up and play and have a legitimate performance of this. And so there's these kinds of 3D spaces um, where the, where the uh, performer is going to these clusters and selecting notes, these little particles that are a little bit like note heads um, and they can play sound and have a kind of little concert um, together if there are like four, or, sorry, if there are like two or, or more players. So you can kind of see that it's this, this work is controlled with a Xbox controller or any mm-hmm. controller, I suppose. Um, and anyone can um, kind of take a, a gander at it and, and just uh, could go on stage and perform it. I would, I would see that as like, you know, picking four people in the audience and to try and perform 20 minutes of it or 15 minutes of it as a legitimate performance of this work. 
Can you hear this? Yes. A little bit? Okay. So this was moving away completely from, from Western notation um, or some kind of concept of fixed uh, paperness, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and moving completely to 3D graphics. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, I just mm -hmm. wanted to say you add that, like this, the spatiality into music, because mm -hmm. um, usually when we listen to music, it's always, you know, we don't think of space. Although space plays a big deal in music performances, but I think by visualizing it into almost like a 3D um, rendering of different ge geometries. I think it really allows uh, players to uh, interpret music from the perspective of space rather than, uh, you know, merely from sound. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of building an instrument for us, but where kind of the instrument and the rhythm of the pieces was kind of based on distances between these clusters and also the affordance mm -hmm. of this thing um, and other types of controllers that we could use. Um, for the work. So when another player appears in the space with you, so you can play with another player and share the same space, they kind of appear like this. And if you kind of enter that same space, strange kind of like black box things happen into the sound. Um, and there's different kinds of things that will happen if three players are in the same space and four players are in the same space. So players do have a way of being able to mess with one another or kind of work together to make sound. So if someone's like mm -hmm. focusing on making a sound, um, they can come over and kind of mess it up if, if they want it ah. as well. So it's kind of like a clash of wavelengths. Yes, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of the, you know, from a, a music place. Um, working with ensembles, kind of where I had left off on, on this kind of music practice before doing what I do now, I guess, um, which is working more directly in virtual worlds and uh, with video games. Um, so I can quickly minimize this and kind of show a preview of some of the stuff that I'm, I'm kind of working with uh, these days. Um, so this is kind of like my virtual studio, I suppose. And if I make this um, smaller, kind of building out, working with in Unity uh, Engine and kind of building out um, these spaces, narrative spaces um, for players to explore and to experience a kind of like speculative fiction narrative um, and kind of thinking again about, you know, um, so much of, of the last couple of, of works were about what players could and could and could not do at any given point in time that, um, you know, you really start to think about game mechanics um, and choices that you allow the player or you don't allow the player um, as ways of meaning making, um, you know, in the performing arts, but then of course, going to straight up video games, that's always been a domain that um, is uh, a part of, of meaning making for people who play video games. Um, and so kind of this aspect of the work, I suppose, is merging um, a lot of the thought that I, I had about what uh, I wish I could do on stage um, and being able in this case to do it in a virtual space. To
other bit. Hello? Hello? Sorry? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. I think my uh, computer is uh, a little bit overloaded by the video. Okay. But yeah, no worries. Yeah, so maybe I can uh, leave it off here. Like I, I suppose that um, one of the, the last thing I can say is one of the, the aspects of this game is that it does take place in this yeah, uh, speculative future where uh, most of the characters are uh, descendants of kind of Hong Kong diaspora of some kind. Um, and that has you know, been a through line of, of some of the work that I've been doing the last um, eight or so years, I suppose, um, is kind of dealing with uh, that diasporic identity and what exactly, what mm. baggage that gives us um what agency that gives to us and and how of course it's always changing like even in like my lifetime like many different ways in which it changed um very yeah. quickly i do have a question about the video this kind of a uh, game mechanic work mm -hmm. so usually there are mainly two ways to interpret such work so one is more from a utopian side perspective or one mm -hmm. can be more dystopian. I guess like for utopian mm -hmm. perspective, it can be like kind of creating a, a very different form of future, kind of envisioning some sort of a potential change of society or potential, potential change of what we're going through. For example, you know, as I, I believe as a Hong Kong diaspora, you know, a, a fresh Hong Kong diaspora. A lot of people, mm -hmm. in a way, they move to I don't know, like London or the States or Canada. There is always like a kind of emotion roller coaster regarding mm. this kind of big relocation. So there's always like a hope of trying to grasp uh, a better future. But then there's also dystopian interpretation where you know the real world is just too much to handle. Mm -hmm. And people just, you know, really would just want to dive into a video game or what we call as a metaphors mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. right? So kind mm -hmm. of really escape, it's a kind of escapism, but it's almost like a detachment from reality and hoping just to indulge in a version of reality that is not tangible. So mm -hmm. when you create this work or have an idea of, you know, really diving into video games and um, game mechanics, do you have also a similar kind of psychological roller coaster, or what? What's really the uh, intention back then to make the work in compared to where you are at now? Um, you know, this uh, kind of working on this game has kind of come at one of the the more uh, complicated times, as as um, and I do think that um, I think when we were starting some of the the work in um hong kong sal about like uh, eight or so years ago it was a little bit more trying to um understand kind of what uh diasporic aspects in ourselves that we could bring to our our work and trying to define that and feel that out and and after doing it for a while um that part is a little bit more clear to us, either like how we approach um, language, or our failure with language, our our, our kind of complicitness in, adap mm. in in adapting, and then at the same time, our wanting to uh, adapt, but then also reject it. This is this kind of like, you know, um, and also not knowing any better when we were younger, and then to to eventually kind of coming to be a little bit older and looking back at you know, some of our behavior and some of especially um, uh, our self-image and, and, and various things in a different context. Like that drove some of that early work here, earlier work and still continues to drive um, this kind of um, um, uh, video game work that I'm doing. And that's also something that I always wanted, that's I, to general extent I always work in. When I work with some kind of fiction or narrative, I'm generally working in a speculative fiction, a kind yeah. of sci-fi place to just uh, give it some distance um but i would say you know this this 
uh, video game is very much not about escapism mm. <laughs> and probably just deals head on with all of those things I just talked about right. um, in that um, I guess the you know the optimistic part of it uh, to a certain extent in this is that they're a lot they, they're still around and they they know that they're around so that is um, in, at least in this game the, the optimism or the um, not a utopia, not a dystopia, but uh, just a complicated mess. I think that's the reality in it. I think mm -hmm. using video game mechanics to reflect that, it, it's quite um, different in a way, because I think a lot of people, um, they're, they don't really, you know, it's just like going to a cinema and watch a movie, right? You, mm -hmm. you kind of want to have a temporary moment to be away from reality or away from something that you're dealing with but playing with this video game later on perhaps you know it's it's not escaping from reality but perhaps from the video game there is a potential to figure out you know what can we do to impact on reality for a real change from something that is mainly virtual i think that's a uh, that's an interesting approach to kind of merge virtual and reality or even art and technology um, in, in a very specific way. So I think what would be nice by closing the uh, studio visit is, uh, do you have any upcoming upcoming projects uh, this year in Canada or even in Hong Kong? I, um, I will say actually that I, as far as I know, and as, as far as I can remember at this moment, um, I am chained to my desk making this game until <laughs> it comes out. <laughs> um, but I do, uh, this will probably come out either at the end of this year um, or the kind of early uh, 2023. Um, and without sounding strange and then our talking will be coming to uh, PC uh, Switch and other consoles pending. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, we hope to see you soon in Hong Kong and hopefully have oh, more yes. projects yeah. to come in between Canada and Hong Kong. So I think before we finish this visit, I just want to see if any of our um, participants would like to ask Remy any questions. You can um, write down the questions in the chat box. So as soon as you do this, I will slowly move around here, just kind of like. I'm still in shock of how how you can make all of this video ren uh, video game rendering. Well, it's definitely so not real. the by myself. It's it's with um, another artist that I'm I'm working with at the studio. Uh, so a lot, I should say a lot of props goes to him as well, Kodai Yanagawa. Um, one thing I guess we were talking about a bit before all of this was that there was a. Um, a lot of because we were essentially cut off from traveling for the last um, at least two years uh, a mm -hmm. lot of this space reflected kind of sp spaces that we were missing uh, either from in in Tokyo or Osaka where he's from and and in Hong Kong um, where we haven't been or at least I haven't been for a couple of years now because of the pandemic um, So, um, oh, Andre has a question. So, uh, Andre wants to know uh, if you can talk a little bit about how independent game making makes use of this mm -hmm. new technology to do virtual narratives. Um, are you thinking specific, like, um, uh, Andre, uh, is it um, specifically Unity or kind of just like a more broad sense of technology? Um, while I guess he's maybe replying to this, I will say uh, that this game probably was not possible um, maybe uh, three or four years ago for us, I think. Um, and part of that is a, a larger uh, movement that's happening with the democratization of a lot of these tools. And you know, we were just talking about our approaches to video games and um, who makes video games and things like this. 
there was a huge gate of entry for people um, to make these kinds of virtual spaces. Um, we saw this like in uh, before kind of more accessible democratized uh, game engines. We, we saw people using mods to, to make things in um, 3D space uh, or in, in any kind of game, I suppose. Um, but uh, what is starting to happen that it's kind of exciting, I think, and, and the direction that I wanted to go to is that because of the this technology being um, more mature um, and easily accessible and something that we could start to to use and it like kind of quote unquote iterate very quickly it goes back to that fast feedback loop like I don't think the performing artist mind or even say my mind or the the theater experimental theater mind um, could have worked in a a kind of video game production workflow prior to the last four years. Um, now what we have is a feedback loop that we're more accustomed to, much actually much similar to what it's like to be in a rehearsal hall without having to pay the rehearsal hall rental fee, um, is uh, um, something that we can really experiment and throw around and iterate very quickly. And this uh, is compounded by the fact that motion capture is also becoming more uh, democratized. And so for example, we have two suits that are um, kind of inside out, quote unquote, uh, um, motion capture suits and where the sensors are on the body as opposed mm. to in the space with a bunch of cameras and there's like ping pong balls and stuff like this. It's more that uh, we could motion capture in any space, which is really does come down to the fact that, you know, we know as artists space is extremely expensive and difficult to maintain. Um, and to, on top of that, a specialized motion capture space would be extremely difficult to maintain um, at, at, for an artist. And so some of these things um, are becoming more affordable, but I think the affordability part is not 100% it. It's really more about um, the speed at which we can see something um, as what you see is what you get um, and kind of again, back to that kind of rehearsal process and, and also allowing to a certain extent that kind of approach and, and brain to work in this space and see what happens and opens up and like what, uh, what kind of virtual narratives um, are, are missing from video games or from these kinds of spaces because the, the, technology or the turnaround time or that feedback loop was too long for the kind of brain that you see um, in experimental performing arts or or uh, in other places like even a composer brain say so I don't know if that answered your question Andre <laughs> no response yeah well so nice to have you with us Remy for today and um, I hope you have a good time to you know introduce yourself and your practice to our Hong Kong audiences um, so before we finish the studio visit I just want to say it again that you know we're very thankful for the support by the Consulate General of Canada and Hong Kong Macau for this collaboration with you know a studio visits with free Canadian art uh, free Hong Kong artists in Canada and in upcoming weeks, we'll also have a few more sessions for that. So please stay tuned to our social media. And Remy, do you have, would you like to share your perhaps social media, you know, um, uh, uh, accounts that people may oh, follow yes. your work? I will, I will do this on the chat. Is this, is this yeah. right? Yeah, that's for Instagram, I assume, right? Uh, I think both. Uh, it's, okay. uh, Twitter and Instagram, I think they're the same ones, yeah. Awesome. So you have the website, you have the Instagram and Twitter. So I, I'm sure it will, you know, please stay tuned to Remy's upcoming projects as well on social media. And uh, last but not least, thank you all for joining us today. And um, uh, see you soon and uh, hope everyone is staying healthy. So yeah, have a nice day. And for Remy, have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.